ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start with the next presentation, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Margaret Jordan. Now, Margaret is an accredited genealogist and has a background in science and mathematics, having taught in a second level school uh, in County Cork. And she is now a professional genealogist. Part of her time, she actually works on the Ireland Y DNA project. Now, we've just heard from Jean Piero about some of the uh, DNA structure of the Irish population. Um, and that, of course, is an academic study. And uh, Margaret actually is running the Y-DNA project, which has over 6,000 members in the 8,000 8, members in the project. So uh, here to tell us about the, the Y-DNA project and what it actually tells us is Margaret Jordan. Please give her a warm welcome. Ireland Y-DNA Project. Now the Ireland Y-DNA Project was set up in 2006 because at that time there were very few Irish surname projects at all and there was also the Genographic Project where people could do a 12 marker DNA test but there was nowhere for those results to go for the Irish males. So there was a double reason there for setting up the Ireland Y-DNA project. Now, just going back to that time frame, um, Family Tree DNA was the company chosen for the project. And um, it started off very small, as you can imagine. And um, over time, it has grown. But um, the, this is just an example here of a certificate that the Genographic Project produced back in 2005. You can see, maybe, that they only tested 12 markers. And these 12 markers, or 12 YSTRs, were enough to, pr to predict your Y haplogroup. And the Y haplogroup that's predicted is R1B, which is defined by the SNP M343. So I'll be talking about haplogroups, and I'll be talking about SNPs. To some extent, I'll be talking about markers or YSTRs. Now, back in the early days, in the early 2000s up to maybe 2010, all we talked about really were YSTRs and broad-based haplogroups. But in more recent years, we've had a huge development in the SNP area. So we're transitioning, if you like, from the YSTRs to the SNPs but both are used extensively and, you know, used together to complement each other. And I'll be showing you a little bit about how that happens as well. Now, it was an exciting time actually in the um, mid to late 2000s because Trinity College were producing a lot of research papers and we amateurs, volunteers, were just swallowing this stuff. It was fantastic. I mean, we had nothing else to go on for Irish Y-DNA, but Trinity College were feeding us all these papers, so there were major discussions about the results and so on. So it was quite an exciting time when Trinity were doing all that research. And all those papers are available free online now, but at the time, I think some of them might have been behind a paywall, and we were all, you know, scampering to try and get hold of them. Now, as I said, back then, a 12 marker prediction, whether it was from Family Tree DNA or the Genographic Project, was enough to give you a Y haplogroup prediction. And it became quite clear early on that most men in Ireland were in the R1B haplogroup. We do have a few in the R1A, we do have some in I1 and I2 and very small amounts possibly are in other haplogroups. But as I said, it became very clear early on that we were focusing more on this little area here. But that R1B is a very ancient SNP. And you can see here on the chart that quite a lot of Europe is defined by R1B. And the darker the color, the higher the percentage 
of the men in that area who have R1B. Now it goes up to over 80% in Ireland and also on the western fringe of Europe. So it's very common in this part of Europe. Now, in the project, this is reflected. We, over the years, we've consistently had about 80 or 81% R1B in the project. We've had a smaller percentage of I1, 6% approximately, and I2, 7%. And then smaller percentages again of the other haplogroups that occur in the project. Um, for example, R1A is 2%, and G is 1%, E 2%, and J 1%. Now I won't be talking about the smaller percentages over here in the talk. I'll be focusing mostly on R1B with some references to I1 and I2, as they're the next biggest haplogroups in the project. Now, Eupedia is a great resource which I've used an awful lot, I must say, especially in preparation for this talk, because um, it has an analysis of all the major Y haplogroups and mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, and it throws in information about the migration and the history of the, you know, the beaker pottery and, and so on. So if you're interested in following up on the origins and migrations of the haplogroups, I would suggest upedia.com. Now here, Upedia shows Ireland, and in fact they got their data from our project, so it should correspond with the data I've given you. Um, but if you look at the comparisons there, the highest areas of R1B, apart from Ireland, would be um, uh, Normandy and Wales should be there somewhere, Wales and Scotland. The western fringes of Europe have the highest proportion of R1B. Now you can do the same for the other haplogroups. Um, in my talk, I combine <coughs> I2A and I2B into just I2A because the terminology for I2 has changed several times over the years. So to keep it simple, I'm you know, not treating I2A and I2B separately. Um, so that's just something you can look up there on Upedia as well to compare the different haplogroups from the different countries. So we started off with R1B, which is here, and now I'm not very good at archaeology, and Paleolithic and Mesolithic and Neolithic are terms that don't come naturally to me, except to say that Paleolithic is very old, you know, and Mesolithic is more recent, but you can see how far back you have to go for the R1B or the M343 SNP. So that really isn't helping us very much with our Y-DNA in terms of telling people that, oh, I'm R1B. You know, we've gone a lot further than that nowadays. But it took us several years to come further on. And we came further on, first of all, by talking about M269. And M269 could be I don't know, it could be 10,000 years old. We don't have precise dates for these SNPs, which is something we're all working towards. But M269 is the prediction that family tree DNA tends to give an awful lot of people. So if you do a Y-DNA test and you get a prediction of M269, that's not telling you an awful lot. If back in the early 2000s, I would have said yes, it was telling us as much as we could find out. But now it's really just the tip of the iceberg. It's, you know, you would need more information. And just on that diagram, I've, you know, I've left out a lot of steps here. I couldn't put them all in. But by the time you get down here, it splits up into U106. And we have some U106 in the project. Not very much, it's less than 4%. I won't be dealing with that today. I could have, but I think that, you know, I had to focus my energies on certain aspects and I figured that this side would be the one that would be most relevant to most people. The P312, the Proto-Italo-Kelto-Germanic. It hasn't yet got to Ireland really. We're, we're still way out there in the well, Middle Bronze Age perhaps, you know. It's quite ancient. Now, the emphasis as I said was on the YSTRs in the 2000s. 
and we went from 12 from the general graphic project and family tree cleaning really always did 37 <coughs> markers but then later on 67 markers became available and only in 2011 actually did 111 YSTRs or markers become available. So we've been going up the scale all the time trying to crunch the numbers with these YSTRs. Now they can't do it all by themselves but I, I personally believe in testing 67 YSTRs. Some people say 37 is, is enough and you go straight to SNPs. But from my experience, not everybody is going to do a lot of SNP testing. You know, from the 8,000 we have in the project, we have about 3,000 men who are RN269. And they're sitting there with no further SNP testing. So that's the reality. Um, so getting people to do 67 markers, at least with those, you can start to try and predict what SNPs they would be positive on. I'll be coming to that a bit more later on. But with 67 markers, there are certain values on some of those markers which can point you in the right direction. It can't tell you for sure you'll be positive on a particular SNP. Well, it almost can in some cases, but in a lot of cases it will certainly give you enough information maybe to jump forward to doing not maybe the next SNP that Family Tree DNA recommends, but a couple of jumps forward and you learn a lot more about your Y haplogroup, group, um, the position of your Y DNA on the Y haplogroup. group. So SNPs of course are opening new ways of grouping people and refining positions on the Y haplo tree. And I think other people have used the term SNP tsunami and this is very true. A couple of years ago we were getting new SNPs all the time and it wasn't possible for us to um, figure out how they all fitted in. So we had to do some work and do a lot of testing of people to see who was positive on them and who was negative so that they could be added to the Y haplogroup tree. But really since the big Y has come along, I think family tree DNA has taken over a lot of that heavy lifting. So we don't have to do as much work as before. But we were trying to get different people to do testing to try and figure out who was positive and who was negative. So a lot of that has been done by Family Tree DNA now. So, of course, with all the changes that have been going on, I mean, it was quite simple in the beginning. It was just anybody, any male, not to be male, who had Irish ancestry on his male line could join the project. But now, because we have so many different kinds of tests, for example, if you did an autosomal DNA test with 23andMe, and you've been given a Y haplogroup prediction, that is not enough to entitle you to join the Ireland Y DNA project because you can't transfer that Y DNA result. You can transfer the latest form of the genographic project results. Now, the latest type of genographic results are all SNP results. Genome 2.0 is what it's called. Some of you might have done that. Have any of you done the Genome 2 2.0 test? Just a few. Do you know about it? Yeah? Okay. So the Genome 2.0 is really based on anthropology, but um, I suppose with it, all the new SNPs that have been found over the years, they are providing results for SNPs which are closer to the modern time frame. But it is um, a research project. It's more geared for um, the scientific community to understand the migration of people, you know, the Y DNA out of Africa spread across the world and in different populations you have different types of Y DNA. So that's really what that study is about. But because Family Tree DNA was the lab, it isn't anymore, but it was the lab for the Genographic Project, you could transfer for free your Genographic, when you still can, you could transfer your Genographic and 2.0 results to family tree DNA. And if you have an Irish male line, please transfer them to the Ireland Y DNA project. You know, please make sure you join that project. Now, um, we also encourage uh, men, of course, to join their surname project. That is critical because the surname administrators, the surname project administrators, are the most familiar with your particular surname. Now, if there isn't a surname project for your surname, of course, the next step would be to join the Ireland Y DNA project. 
um, but the surname projects are the best because they can you know, look at your results within a small context. We're a huge project. We can't really look at everybody's individual result and compare them with other people with the same surname. We can't do that. What we do is we tend to group people by SNPs. So it's not by surname, it's broad groups based on SNPs. So I think I've gone over this, the, the prerequisites for joining the project are that you, you, know, you have to have a Y-DNA test, you have to be male. It has to be a test that's transferable to family tree DNA. Um, now, if you don't have knowledge of your paternal line, that doesn't restrict you from joining. If you have a close match at 67 markers with other men in the project or other men with Irish surnames, you are entitled to join because we want to try and help you. That's our project. I mean, we deal with individuals. We may be a huge project, but our main focus is the individual and their needs. If you are looking for a biological male line, we would be delighted to have you in the project so that you can explore whether it is a male Irish line or not, and so on. But if you, um, if you just vaguely think you might have an Irish line, you have to know something about it. You have to have documented evidence within, say, the last 500 years. I mean, there's no point saying a thousand years ago um, my ancestors um, might have been in Ireland. You know, we need something more because um, we're focused on a genealogical time frame. So that would be about 500 years. And also, there's no point telling me that you did an ancestry autosomal DNA test and you're told you're 60% Irish. Not good enough. We need it to be on the Y line. Even if it's only 1% or less, we need it to be on the Y line. So just keep that in mind. Um, now, as I said, we focus on individuals. I want to emphasize that. We talk to people, we have an activity feed. You might be familiar with that, like a Facebook sort of messaging system on a lot of the projects. And we are very active on that. And people ask questions. We administrators try to answer them, but other members try to answer them too. And members talk to each other and they find out more. I mean, people will say, I haven't a clue. I got my results. What do I do now? Well, we can look at their results and we can advise them. And then other people can learn from that advice as well. And we do deal with people by email, of course, as well. But more I find that people are using the activity feed. They feel happier dealing with it there in that context. But anyway, um, we relate very closely to why haplogroup group projects, surname projects, and why DNA research and regional wide geographic projects. And I just want to refer to these in turn. I've mentioned the Irish surname projects. That's fairly obvious, I think. And the Y Hapla group projects are becoming more important as people do more and more SNP testing. It's becoming so specific that there are projects for particular SNPs and if you are a person with that particular SNP, you go for that project as well. You can join as many projects as you like, but you know the main um, types of project would be the surname projects, the Y Hapla group projects, and the um, geographic projects, which is what we are. Now the Y-DNA research there, I put that in because it's the, si it's the community, it's the genetic genealogy enthusiasts, it's the people who do the research, like the previous speaker and the speaker coming next. I'm sort of in the middle, the amateur in the middle. But it's everybody contributing. I mean, there are a lot of people involved, like Mike Walsh, Alex Williamson, um, Nigel McCarthy, you've, you've heard some of these names mentioned already, but they're all working in the background and we all benefit from their <coughs> efforts because they're all helping us to understand what's going on with the SNPs, it's particularly with the SNPs nowadays. Now this is just about our project. It started off 2006 and we're nearly at 8,000 members. It sounds like a lot of people the majority would not be from Ireland, not living in Ireland. And I think I would like to put out a call here for Irish men to do a Y-DNA test if you haven't done it already. We really do need your participation in the project.
because we have lots of Americans, we have Australians, we have Canadians, we have some Irishmen. Um, I can't give you an exact figure because I would have to go through everybody's account and with 8,000 people I couldn't possibly. But from my you know, dealing with people I know that the majority come from outside of Ireland and they would love to reconnect with their Irish um, male line in Ireland and it would be fantastic so to have more Irish males who are living in Ireland and know where their ancestors came from joining the project and joining their surname projects. Now as I said we have nearly 8,000 members and a lot of those, most of those live outside the country and, in all, and we have about 3,000 people who are stuck on this RN269 who haven't done any more slip testing. We also have some people who've only done 12 markers, about 766. I think these must be from that original genographic project that, you know, they transferred from the first genographic project and didn't go any further. And that's so long ago now, they probably lost interest and they're not going to do any more. But if any of you are one of these people here, please do more testing. Okay, we have a few here in 25, and we have um, 1,929 and 37 markers. That I would prefer to see more in the 67 marker bracket, but we have quite a few. And at 111, we have 2,305. And the good news here is that we have over 1,000 people who've done the big Y. I was actually surprised when I saw that figure myself because I didn't expect it. But that's good. I mean, that shows we're going somewhere. And as I said, there are some transfers from the genome 2.0, but they could actually be included over there as well. Um, because when people transfer their genome 2.0 results, it's all SNP results. It doesn't allow you to compare your result directly the way the markers do. So you're sitting there in the project and we can't do anything with your result. So if you've transferred a genome 2.0 result, please do slip to, oh, sorry, do 37 or 67 markers so that you can compare your results with other men. Now, I mentioned earlier that in the 2000s we were excited at the papers coming from Trinity. Well, we also got very excited in 2010 when the first Irish genome was sequenced. I must say, I always remember that day when I discovered it. I had just got off the ferry from uh, Cork to Swansea, and I was in the local McDonald's restaurant, you know, eagerly checking my email, and I got the news that uh, everybody was chatting about this. And I was feeling, oh my God, one day I go away, you know, everybody is talking about this. But anyway, it was an exciting time. Again, we've had several exciting moments, and this is one of them when we got the Irish genome um, sequenced. And now, it turned out to be L21, which is a SNP, which is further down than the SNPs I've shown you so far. I've shown you the M343 down to M269, and I showed you it goes down to P312. And you go down further again, and I'll be showing you diagrams with that, to the L21. Now, L21 was quite well established at that point, so it wasn't that the SNP was new, but it was exciting that an Irish genome had been sequenced and it was L21. Now, I find the comment here, I quoted it from the paper. None of the five markers, now they mean SNPs here, none of the five SNPs define known subgroups of R1B S145, that's a different name for L21, could be found in our individual indicating that he potentially belongs to an as yet undefined branch of one. Now they're saying there were five branches of L21 in 2010. I don't know if anybody could name those five branches. I could, could name two straight away. M222 had already been discovered and L2 and also L159.2 in fact was the third and I think L19 L1593 and L19, sorry, start again, L195. They're the five. I read the paper afterwards again to find those SNPs. So that was before the SNP tsunami. So the SNP tsunami hasn't been all that long ago in terms of all these um, branches of the white apple tree being discovered. Now, just to give you some information on L21. 
Again, you can see the same pattern here. The darker areas are to the west, very much focused on Ireland and the western coast of Britain and France, Normandy there again. And the figure here says that the darkest areas have over 60% L21. Now we find that is mirrored in the Ireland YDNA project. So we're getting closer and closer to splitting this white hockle tree into more interesting branches that eventually, hopefully, will come down to surname lines. We're getting closer. Now, this is the kind of follow-up diagram to the original diagram I was showing you. You know, we had the M343, M269, P312, and down here to L21. So our project focused quite a lot on L21 because the majority of members belong to that um, you know, branch of the y haplo tree. And since then, another SNP below that, called DF13, was found. And our new focus is on branches below DF13 because, as I quote here from, um, I think it was White Full, which described the SNP, almost everything below our L21, according to, sorry, Y Browse. Now, DF63 over there on the right does occur to a very, very, very small extent in the project, but it's mostly McFarland and McFarlane uh, in Scottish surnames. But our focus is definitely on DF13. So, I have another diagram here, which is a kind of a schematic diagram. I don't claim to include all the slips on this part of the white hopper tree, but I'm including the main ones and the branches that I want to focus on. Um, for example here, DF21, I've given numbers here rather than percentages. They may look like fairly small numbers to you, but you can compare across. Like in DF20, in DF13, we have two about, it's changing all the time because it's a dynamic project. 213 are DF21. 164 are FGC 11134, and we have 20 who are FGC 5494. And um, now I didn't put in a number here because this is like an umbrella for the branches down here. This was only found recently to cover all of these other branches. So we have um, in the project we have nine people in this group and we have 253 in the Z253 group and 111 in the Z255 group and over here under this newly discovered umbrella snip if you like it covers all of these which originally were sort of directly connected under DF13 until they were until this snip was found and we have 31 DF41 1,135 DF49, <coughs> and the reason for that is because underneath it you have the M222 SNP, which most people would be familiar with. It's the um, Northwest Ireland SNP. Now, L1335, surprisingly, we have 36, and Z251, 31, and so on over along. Um, so, just from the project, we have you know, counted the number of people in each of these subgroups in the project. I emphasize it's only what we have in the project. Because there's a DF21 project, a y group project, which would be entirely DF21 people. And it would be able to break up DF21 into all the sub-branches and so on as far as they can possibly go. Now, in blue, I've listed the branches for which we have subgroups in the project and in red I have highlighted the ones I'm going to talk about. I can't really talk about them all so I tried to go for the biggest ones or perhaps the ones with some interesting thing to say. So DF49 I'll talk a bit more about and Z253 and FGC11134 and this one here DF21. So I'll be just giving you a little bit extra on those. It won't be comprehensive, but it'll just be delving a little bit deeper into them. Now, as I mentioned, DF49, 
is the largest part of the Z39589. And why is that? Because M222 is the SNP which is down below DF49. And M222 was a SNP that was known about back in 2006. So it's been very heavily researched and it's very common in the area on the map. Now, you might extend that area in Ireland a little bit. That was an older map. But um, with M222, I've said it's easy to predict it based on the markers or the YSTRs. It has distinctive values on certain markers which enable people to say straight away, oh yes, you will be M222 if you test. But the problem with the people who are M222 is that even if they go up to 111 markers, they will be matching lots and lots of different surnames. It doesn't help to distinguish between one surname and another in a lot of cases. It's just there are you know, so many um, people with the same kind of results. And that can be the problem with markers. But Big Y and Y Hopper Group projects are working on this and they have um, you know, gone much further than M222 at this stage. And here's my diagram for that. Um, I said we we're talking about DF49 and you come down to M222 and then that breaks up into other branches and this branch here is the most common one in the Ireland YDNA project. We have 87 people who are S658 and then you come down here to DF105. We didn't sort out any groups here, we went down to this level. And you can see here, even at this level, we're able to subdivide. And this is only the tip of the iceberg, Sorry. because we're a broad group, we can't really deal with every individual SNP. But I decided I would just examine one of them. I would look at S588, and before I do that though, I should mention that we are getting down to the um, genealogical time frame and a man called Ian MacDonald of Strathclyde University is one of the people that has been trying to estimate ages of SNPs. And you know, in his analysis he has M222 with a best estimate of 310 BC for the origin of it and you know, a 95% confidence level between 871 BC and 114 AD. Now, we're not saying these are absolutely correct, they may be proved to be wrong, but it's like a, a working model at the moment. And then you come all the way down here through these snips down to DF105, and you find that we're down to 214 AD approximately. But that's good news, because we're getting closer and closer to being able to use these SNP results in looking at surnames. Now, again, another diagram, you'll be sick of my charts. Um, this is DF105, and I said I was going to look at S588, where we have 77 members, and I just added in some of the age estimates by Ian MacDonald, and here it's approximately 483 AD. I, I emphasize approximately. And then you come down through several more slips, and you get down to one A1742, which is approximately 899 AD, so we're nearly approaching 1000 AD when many surnames started. Now, from personal communication with Mike McNally, who's the administrator of the Gormley project, he was able to tell me that from Big Y, he is working on the connection between, say, Graham and McNally, for example. And he has done a lot of work in the, you know, by reading the manuscripts and looking at the ancient genealogies. I'm certainly leaving that to him and other people. But um, I just say here that we're getting down to the level from big Y and SNP testing that you can start to use the results to get down to the surname level and see how those surnames are or are not connected. And there would be a lot of work for people in the future studying the annals and trying to work out uh, if the annals are correct or do they fish what we're finding out from the DNA. Now, that was my example for DF49, a little bit of a run through because um, I thought that was an important one to do. Now the next one I've chosen is the Z253. 
and you can see it's 68% of the umbrella slip there, ZZ10. And why is that? Well, you might remember that I said that L226 was one of the first SNPs to be discovered. It was one of those five branches that they knew about when they sequenced the Irish genome in 2010. So a lot of research has been going on on L226. You can see here that we have 55 people who are at L226. Some of those have gone further and they are, you know, positive for the next SNP. And then down here you have another SNP. So, you know, L226 has been very heavily researched over the years, and um, some of the others not so well researched. But that, the point I want to make there is that um, we are moving forward all the time with the SNPs and getting closer and closer to the modern day. Now, the L226 SNP, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, especially the O'Brien project there, I'm treading carefully here. Um, if I'm wrong, correct me. L226 was discovered in 2009 and forms the largest part of the project for that, okay. Um, it's easy to identify from markers, yeah, so that's handy as well. So if you have done your 67 markers, um, the project administrator of the O'Brien project will be able to tell you, um, yes, you are going to be at 226. And, you know, it seems to be one of those SNPs that originated in Ireland. <coughs> there, I haven't discovered too many of them. Now, it may not have originated here, but it's definitely very prevalent in those areas. So I leave that answer to, to the O'Brien project there. Um, my other focus is on the DF21. Now, we, we have, I've shown you here a diagram of different branches. Again, the blue are the ones we have groups for in the... Ireland Y-DNA project, but again there will be separate y haplogroup group projects for many of these. For example, DF25, you know, is a, a very old SNP and there will be a lot of sub-branches here. Now I'm not talking about that one, I think the two I'm talking about here are going to be Z16281 and Z3000 because you can actually attach those to the ancient genealogies. But before I do that, sorry, I should mention another exciting moment is when we got the ancient DNA results from Dan Bradley and his Trinity group, when he, in 2016, published the paper that found that of the three men who had Y-DNA analysis done on the, from the Rathlin Island burial site, the Bronze Age burial site, you know, because we're dealing with ancient remains, it wouldn't be possible to analyze the Y-DNA fully. But they found that one man was L21, one you could go further, you could say it was DF13, and the third man was DF21, which is great. Of course, you'd love to know which branch of L21 he was, but because the DNA wasn't, you know, able to tell us that, we don't know. Now, I've read somewhere in the analysis of M222, they're still waiting for their first ancient DNA um, man with M222. Even though there's been so much research done on M222, they still haven't got any ancient DNA, uh, you know, relating to that SNP. Anyway, the, the two branches I wanted to talk about briefly are the Kingdom of Argela. It's the three collars. I don't know if anybody is familiar with the three collars. I'm not terribly familiar with it myself. But apparently, they have a SNP, Z3000, which seems to cover men who come from the three colors um, area or clan. I'm not sure what term to give it. But again, there are markers which are pretty good at defining this group. One of them is an interesting DYS425 equal to zero, a null marker. Now, a null marker means they couldn't read it, but you will find that, there, that the men in this group have a zero for, four to, for DYS 425. That's unusual, so it's another indicator of the Z3000, as long as you have the other markers as well. So you can use your markers. This is my point. Don't throw those markers out. They are still very valuable for identifying um, SNPs that you could be positive for. So that's the three colours from the, that particular slip. 
The other one is the Eli Carroll Group, a fourth century clan. And again, I went to the project. There, you know, there are projects for everything now. So the project listed the surnames there. And the SNP is the Z1628 one SNP and others below. I mean, there's constant research going on um, on this, of course. And the particular markers there, DYS390 equal to 25 and DYS492 equal to 11. So they use the markers as well to predict whether you'd be positive for the Z1628 one SNP. Now, the other example I have is under the FGC 11134, and it's an important branch down here. The CTS 4466 is an important branch in the south of Ireland. It's been researched very heavily by, you know, clans like um, McCarthy, O'Malley, um, Heath. They're all the southern, you know, South Irish was the name we called them before we had the SNP. So CTS 4466 branches out again, and we have groups with, say, three men who are A541 and so on across there. And basically, we stopped here. L270 seems to refer to O'Sullivan very consistently. And um, now, I haven't looked into this myself, but Nigel McCarthy, who does an awful lot of work in this area, gave me this chart where he has gone forward and assigned these branches to the different surnames based on his own research. So you can see we're getting more and more down to the level of surnames and maybe family lines in the future. Um, again, he's relating, also Nigel is working on relating those surnames to the ancient genealogies for the Ownacht clan. And I certainly haven't delved into that, but there will be a lot of information coming out on that in, you know, fairly shortly because they have done the analysis. Now, um, I've more or less come to the end of DF13. I have a bit more afterwards, but I want to just kind of summarize that part. That big Y analysis is helping us to show surname affiliations and separate them from others using SNPs. But big Y is also showing branches within groups of men sharing the same surname and citizen scientists, academics and individuals are contributing an awful lot. So it's a huge network of people putting in a group effort. And you know, you, as I said, there are concerning or there are projects for everything. You'll find Munster Project, you'll find a Galway Project, you'll find um, a Breathly Project. You've, you know, there will be geographical projects, but you will find why have the group projects um, which relate perhaps to more one part of the country than another. So go looking for projects. Find what projects would suit your needs the best. Don't just stick with your surname project. Join the Why Have the Group project, um, a white geographical pro project that's catering for your particular um, branch of the Why Have the Group. Now, as I said, there was just a small part two to this, and it's dealing with I1 and I2. I1 and I2 are found in the project in small numbers, 6 and 7%. And just to have a look at I1 first, in general, in Europe. I1 is basically associated with Scandinavia and the Germanic countries. But in Ireland, we're supposed to have 10% I1. Now, again, probably associated with the Vikings. I can't actually tell you whether we have that or not from the Ireland YDNA project. We have people who are I1 all right, and they have the M253 SNP, which is defining I1. But a huge number of them have not done any more SNP testing. They were predicted by Family Tree DNA to be M253, and they sat there. So I don't know. A few have gone on, and you can see that some of them, 23, are L22, and 39 are Z58, and a small number are Z63. Well, this would be the Nordic branch. These would be more the Germanic branches. But I can't really tell you any more than that because we don't have the data. I would defer very strongly to the I1 haplogroup projects and the other haplogroup projects which deal with the specific branches. So if you're I1, 
go looking for those particular Hatha groups to help you learn more. Now I2, I, I2 breaks up here in the project to I2A1 and I2A2. And I'll show you maps first about their frequency in Europe. This is I2A1 and the dark colours show you the highest concentrations. But you see here in Ireland, we have, I think it's a 5 to 10% shown on this map. This is from Eupedia. And we can't really get this kind of data from the project because we don't have data from, say, the west of Ireland there. We don't have enough men. We need a project there in Mayo that will analyse the data for Mayo and tell us what, what is going on there. So this is why the, what, the Y Geographic projects or the, even the Y Happy Group project is useful to tell us what's going on. Now, the other branch of I2 in Ireland is the A I2A2, and here you see a nice dark patch, meaning there's um, over 10% here in the north, which seems to um, you know, be paralleled in Scotland. Now again, in the Ireland YDNA project, we can look at the data we have for what it's worth. We have an awful lot of people, 125 who were predicted to be P37, which is I2A1. We have um, 204 people who are predicted to be N223, and so on. But this is the family tree DNA prediction. I think they would not have gone on to do any more um, SNP testing, but some people have. Some people have gone on and gone down further. And in fact, L161 is supposed to be the SNP that occurs in the west of Ireland, according to Eupedia. But again, I can't prove that to you because I don't have the data. But it would be nice to have the data, so any men from Mayo, um, please do testing. I believe, I think Jared told me today that Enda Kenny, uh, our previous T shop, was. Um, what did you say he was? N a P37? I, I, I too want. But it, Genographic tested 100 people in Mayo, yeah. and they published a paper on okay, it. Okay, yeah. sorry. So, you know, it's a Mayo paper anyway, and the Mayo results give us um, a possibility there of I2A1 in present there. Now, as I said, A2, I2A2 is the other one, which, again, according to Wikipedia, is more the northeast of Ireland. And it would be nice to see a follow-up done on that to see if that is the case. And again, you can go down, I, these are not the last branches. These can all be broken up into smaller branches. But again, we're a broad project, we can't do it. But there is an I2 project which will do that, and other projects as well. So there's plenty out there, you know, plenty of projects to join, depending on your particular YDNA. So we can't find an ancestor's location. We're an umbrella group, we're a catch-all group. We take anybody, any male who's got Irish Y-DNA, um, regardless of surname, we're not really worried about what your surname is, because surnames change, people, when they emigrate, their surnames become changed. You have, you know, um, <coughs> an instance where your surname changes, so we're not worried about surname. It's just, if you have an Irish male line, or if you match Irish males closely at 67 markers, that's fine. And we look beyond surnames and accept all surnames and why hacker groups. And I personally, I know other people don't, advise, I would advise to do 67 or even 111 markers, join relevant projects, do SNP packs or the big Y. Now I haven't really mentioned how you do the, the SNPs if you weren't doing the big Y. You can do individual SNPs. They can be pricey because you're paying $39 each time. But if you pick a relevant SNP pack, and project administrators will always help you select the right SNP pack. The SNP pack includes, or well, could be 40, or I'm, I'm not sure, but it has a huge number of SNPs. And you'll be positive for some and negative for others. But the general price for those is either $99 or $119. So you, you can see it's value for money because you then find out a lot more by paying that amount of money rather than spending $39 several times over. So, um, I think that's it. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, questions for Margaret? So, 
Yeah, we have one here from John O'Brien. <laughs> Make a <your> correction. <laughs> Tremendous presentation. I really enjoyed it. That gets you a bigger picture of everything. Uh, is there a way of you knowing out of the 8,000 how many are Irish born versus non Irish born? Or is that a very difficult thing well, to do? Well, I, 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 I think I mentioned it's very difficult. I mean, we have addresses for all the members, but even for me to go through all those addresses and find out which ones are in the US and which ones are in Ireland, which ones are in Australia. It's too much like hard work. But even with those people, even if you have their address, I don't know if they were born in Ireland or not. Some people give their earliest ancestor, which does tell you um, where their earliest ancestor was born. That's about as much as we could do really. But it would be I'd love to have all that all those numbers. How much interface do you have with the various Haplogroup project administrators? Well, not a huge amount with the administrators. I think I would have more contact with the members of my project and I would then look at the results charts in the Y Haplogroup projects and use their work and advise my member who's asking the question on that base. Because, I mean, I have to draw from everywhere to give advice. It's not all in our project. You know, you have to use the Y Hapla groups like Y Full and ISOG and Family Tree DNAs, Hapla, um, Y Tree, I should say. You have to use all the resources available, and the Y Hapla groups are a fantastic resource. And the main thing is they publish their results online. Um, I, I must say, I'm throwing something here. I hate when people keep their results private because you cannot share the valuable information then. And if, if some projects are not allowing us to see any of their results, we can't learn from that and share it with other people. So I think sharing your results is very important. Absolutely. And I think one of the great things about the Ireland Y DNA project is the fact that you're actually getting an overview yes. of the entirety of Ireland. Whereas, of course, the Hapla Group project administrators are probably just looking at one particular branch yeah. of descent. Yeah. But uh, do you get, have a, a, because of this overview, do you feel you're actually getting a better idea of what makes the Irish Irish? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. No, but I keep asking the same question. I'm trying to find out what's really Irish. Which snip is Irish? Which one happened in Europe? Which one, you know? But I think that the, the more work we do on it with the big Y and getting down to the surname levels, I think that it will, you know, feed us that kind of information about you know, what's Irish and what isn't Irish. But it is a difficult question. I don't have the answer. Uh, and the last question for me is, uh, do you get a feel for the various migrations that might have come into Ireland? Because we, we know that you know, there's been obviously a Celtic wave, or so-called Celtic wave, coming into Ireland. And then after that, there might have been a Viking influence as well. But there might also have been smaller influences like Huguenot, Palatine, yes, Jewish. Yes. Are you getting a feel for, for how, what kind of contribution these different migrations might have yes. made to the overall Y-DNA picture? Um, it's very difficult, actually. Um, as I said, say, with the Viking, I can't answer that because we don't have, say, a, a database which is focused on Ireland and something which tells us, you know, these people came to Ireland in the Viking times because they had the Viking Y-DNA. We have people in America and in Australia who think their ancestors came from Ireland and we need more Irishmen, I think is the bottom line. <laughs> really. Get out there and get testing yeah, everybody. I think so, yeah. Okay, uh, well we have to call it a day there unfortunately. But uh, Margaret Jordan, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.